lot of pl- uh, different planning projects I have actually been involved in. I love, as part of my work, I get to travel interstate. Um, and for me, seeing different jurisdictions and different communities and how people use their space and place um, has been a career highlight for me and has been quite defining in how I make decisions and make recommendations for other projects to come. In saying that, I do love local projects, particularly in places where I frequent, you know, such as beach communities or coastal communities. And I guess if I was to really pick a project highlight was actually a project that we finished recently in a coastal suburb strategic planning project. We finished last year in a coastal community that I regularly walk my dog in and it's planning the future 30 years. Um, There's not a lot of growth that can go in, but there's a lot of potential for amenities and recreation. It would be wonderful to see those come to fruition over time um, and how future communities would actually use those spaces. Fantastic. So is it fair to say that planning is living up to your expectations? Definitely living up and um, exceeding, I guess, my initial expectations. I don't think I would ever imagine even three years ago that I would be in a position I am in now um, on the projects that I am on and working with the people that's both colleagues, allied professionals, and I guess my clients, you know, those that I really have the privilege to actually work with and, you know, come up with a solution or, or help them with their their projects. And what's your current role at the moment? I'm a senior environmental planner with Ensura. Ensura is the consulting arm of Hydro Tasmania. So while we have a focus on water and power infrastructure, both in Tasmania and nationally, we also get ourselves involved in other projects that we think are aligned with our company values around sustainable and livable communities. Local strategic projects are a huge part of that and how we can actually make a place better for ourselves, the communities, and even our colleagues. This sounds a wonderful new area to be going into. So I look forward to seeing how your career continues on. Let's move on and talk about your award. What did it mean to you to be named the PEER National Young Planner of the Year for 2023? I guess it was a really validating moment for me. I think I was hugely surprised. There were some really strong um, candidates in my year, all of whom I think were deserving of the award. But I guess for me personally, I went into a field of planning that was probably less common, if I could say so. As a graduate, I wanted to get into infrastructure planning. So planning those really big things, as I called it, you know, transmission lines, wind farms, um, you know, dams and things like that. Unlike, you know, really key planning issues like housing, transport, I guess I wanted to focus on the bigger infrastructure. When I was awarded that National Young Planner of the Year Award, it gave me, I guess, a boost of confidence that this area of planning has a huge potential. I mean, it's hugely relevant to other fields of planning like housing, like social, recreational. It's all interrelated, but gave me a boost of confidence that what I was doing, I'm on the right track and there's a huge future for me to explore and for my colleagues to explore, but also a moment that I could take and take to other planners, younger planners that say, you know, there is a huge potential and there are some really important important issues that we need to distill in this field of planning and inspire other people to also take up similar fields of planning that I guess are are less common. But actually, at the end of the day, we all work together and, you know, we're all sitting at the same table trying to solve the same issues. It's just where our, I guess, where our passion lies. The provision of infrastructure is fundamental to growth and it's it's often an area that is criticised for being neglected, maybe up front, you know, housing policies and everything get pushed and people say, well, what about the infrastructures to support them? It's such an important part of um, what planners do. And I think that's what I've, you know, found over time leading up to, you know, being awarded and obviously further after being awarded is the provision of infrastructure is hugely critical in solving some of the really key issues and that there's, yes, so much more to understand and, and work with communities on. Your journey in nominating for the Young Planners Award is a truly interesting and inspiring one. You first had to be, I guess, recognised as the Tasmania Young Planner of the Year to be considered and to win the National Young Planner of the Year. And when we were preparing for the podcast, you talked a little bit about that journey. You certainly didn't just wake up one morning and thought to yourself, hey, I think I'm going to nominate. (laughs) You took a very strategic approach that actually spanned a couple of years to putting yourself out there and nominating for a Young Planner of the Year award. Can you share with our listeners the journey that you went through in nominating? 
Um, yeah, definitely. So I was incredibly lucky to have a mentor from very early on in my career and who remains one of my mentors today. And really, they knew me more than I knew myself as, as a person from day one. And I think what was amazing was that we only met through work. So it wasn't even someone that I knew prior to my planning profession. But I think more importantly, they knew where my strengths and weaknesses were from the get-go and developed both of them in a really strategic way. So they definitely pushed me where I was really strong, but provided me opportunities to turn those weaknesses into strengths. And for me, I'm in total depth of the help and guidance that they have provided me throughout my career. But I guess it was this mentor who, you know, kind of sat me down a couple of years ago prior to me nominating and said, you know, down the track, this is the award we should put you in for, but let's work towards it and actually plan it and uh, think about what are the things that would make you a good candidate going into the nomination. So we sat down one day and we noted all the things. We looked at the criteria and look, the criteria has changed over a few years, but largely there's still the things that it covers are still similar. And so we kind of looked through all the things that would make me a strong candidate for the award. None of the things were out of the way. They also weren't things that I would just do one off just because I want to take this award home. It was things that I should do that would make me a better planner, you know, over time, would make me be a better decision maker and be able to work through problems strategically. So I suppose between my mentor and I, we developed a plan. And I think this is really important because you should actually plan for things like this and look at what kind of other opportunities, things like sitting on divisional committees and volunteer roles, what do you want to do to actually allow you to be in with a better chance? So I guess I definitely didn't wake up one morning and decided I was going to nominate. I really kind of sat down with my mentor and we did check in after each year as part of our development plan. We checked in and looked at what things I needed to improve on as a person and as a planner to make myself a, a better candidate. So yeah, I guess it was probably a slightly different journey, a longer journey, but I suppose it probably paid off in that regard. No, I think that's, I think it's fantastic. I love that you have a mentor. You've touched on it briefly, but how does having a mentor assist you? Is it something you'd recommend to other young planners to team up with a mentor? Definitely. Um, having a mentor is really important. I think we go through ups and downs as a professional, whether that be a student, a graduate, you know, or even seniors and principals. Think early stage career professionals, having a mentor there, you have someone to turn to when you've got problems. And these problems can actually not be problems. They could just be self-doubt moments. And I've definitely had a number of them. And a mentor can turn around and validate or, you know, help you through those. They can also help you through difficult moments. For example, with clients, I've certainly had them where, you know, a difficult client comes through and I'm just like, oh, well, I really don't know how to deal with this person in a nice manner. You ask for help because your mentor's probably gone through a similar situation. I think it's also important that the mentor doesn't actually need to be in the same field as you. It just, it helps that they're in a similar field. But I think what's really important is a mentor has walked a career path before you've walked yours. And they've certainly got experiences to tell and share that are really, I guess, valuable for us. And so I definitely would approach people to see if they're happy to mentor you. And I think for, you know, slightly older people, open yourself up to mentoring someone. I certainly have really valued mentoring a couple of younger planners at work because through knowledge sharing, you actually learn a lot about yourself and other people and the profession as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's great to hear that you are now becoming a mentor as well to, to others. So congratulations on that as well. Being named Young Planner of the Year at both a state and a national level, how has it changed your appreciation of the planning profession? I think it's made me realise just how broad our profession is, um, and but also how interrelated we all are. I think when you look at some of the other awardees that have actually won the National Young Planner of the Year before me, and just the really diverse um, career paths that people went through before the award and, you know, have come to after the award. There's a lot of opportunity to broaden the appreciation of planning more broadly for both the government, not-for-profit organisations, allied professionals. So I think it actually opens up the appreciation of planning more broadly for everyone. And certainly that's, you know, one of my deepest, I guess, reflections upon winning is just how much broader my world's kind of become. What advice would you give to other young planners who are thinking of nominating in their state for a peer young planner award? Definitely sit down with a plan. And that might mean that you don't nominate this year, you might nominate next year. You should work out what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and try and get involved in 
committees, get involved in even writing some contributions for the planning news or the planning magazine for your state, even some opinion articles for papers. I think having a broader experience and appreciation makes your nomination stronger. I also think it's important to talk to other people that have won the award. And I certainly spoke to other people, um, not necessarily people who have won the award, but people who have won their state and gone on to the nationals, get their advice and get their suggestions around how to actually improve on your own nomination and what kind of things people are doing. Um, I think it's not just me that plan forward. You know, some people plan a couple of months. I guess I, I probably took it to the extreme a little bit and planned it for a few years. But I think what more importantly is there are so many good planners out there. And at the end of the day, you know, we all deserve an award for the contributions we make. At the end of the day, there's only oh so many people that nominate themselves and only one winner per state and one for national. So you want to put yourself out there as the best possible version of yourself. So that takes a bit of planning. And ironically, I guess we're planners and we should be good at planning. <laughs> we should be good at planning. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit generally about PA young planners. You've talked about that, I guess, in the lead up to nominating you seize the opportunity to get involved in PIA and to participate in the Tasmanian branch of the divisional committee. Can you tell me a little bit more about the work that you've been doing with PIA? Yeah, definitely. So I was involved in the Tasmanian Young Planners Network um, a little while ago. So it was actually when the YP picked up again in Tasmania. So it was a little bit um, quiet for a couple of years. And then um, in my year, when I was in my first year of my planning degree, a couple of us kind of, you know, joined hands, I suppose, and, and reinvigorated the committee. But I guess outside of that, I also um, volunteer on the divisional committee. And that was after I left the YP. But I also sat for a little while on the policy and advocacy subcommittee for Tassie and chaired that for two years as well. It was a huge stepping stone. There was a lot of things I didn't know. I guess I had the support of my whole committee. Um, I was the youngest member and the freshest planner, but I learned so much about some of the policy decisions that came before me, some of the planning decisions and, and how planning, I guess, has evolved over time in Tasmania. So it was actually, a huge, while it was so steep as a learning curve, it was also yeah really, really valuable in actually picking up you know, knowledge. And it's almost like a yeah, a speed course to actually understand what had happened over, you know, the last two decades in Tasmania in planning. I also now sit on the editorial committee for the planning news, which is the magazine between a magazine, the planning magazine for Victoria and Tasmania. Um, and that has opened up some opportunities to talk with different type of planners or planning advocates and planning enthusiasts in Victoria in particular and the broad uh, range of issues they're getting. And that has really, yeah, opened up my eyes to planning issues. I guess not so much on-ground planning issues. There's a lot of policy issues that we get to discuss and, and um, that has been really valuable. So I basically contribute a monthly column around, you know, issues in Tasmania, around the new faces we're getting. So a bit of a monthly bulletin, as I call it. So yeah, I've, I've been involved in PR basically since I, since I joined up, which was kind of a couple of weeks after I started my planning degree. I've really valued the time to both contribute to the profession, to the committee, but also as an opportunity to learn. You, you learn so much from particularly the life fellows and the fellows who have been around for so long and they're so willing to share information. And it's, yeah, it's a really great way to learn. I think the other great thing that all that involvement and work would have given you is an amazing network. I've always found myself that, you know, the power of a network cannot be underrated in, in planning, being able to pick up the phone and to speak to somebody, you know, whatever government agency or council or, you know, whatever it is you need is, is a huge advantage. Most definitely, yeah. Being able to pick up the phone and, and just talk to someone is the easiest way to solve a problem generally and is the most easy and less awkward way to solve a problem, really. You're right. It's given me an incredible network of not just planners, but also, you know, architects, engineers, lawyers. It's just given me a really broad range of people that I now know that I can call upon if I need them and who would be willing to help um, to solve problems. And, and I guess that is the beauty of joining, you know, something like PR and being involved in the various committees is actually the opportunity to connect. Yeah, absolutely. And I think touched on it several times in how you've been talking about your experience, but I think planners are within our network, incredibly helpful to other planners. 
Most definitely. I think we sometimes are the middleman um, and we facilitate a lot of decisions and a lot of discussions. You know, I think planners are also great listeners by nature. So yeah, most definitely. Let's move on. And you you touched on that you feel that writing opinion pieces is a beneficial a way to get notice and to elevate your career. And you wrote an opinion piece for the Mercury in which you describe planning as being fun. What do you find fun about our profession? Everything that we actually get to dabble in. Um, I think it's really diverse. You get to talk to the community. You get to inform and influence, you know, the places that you yourself hang out. It's really interactive, I would say. And that's what um, makes it really fun for me. I think People underestimate the power of planning at times, and and I certainly did prior to undergoing a planning degree. I kind of had no idea that this was like this. And I think at the end of the day, it's also fun because it, you get to drive your destiny a little bit in that you you can decide what you want to do. Some people are really passionate about social planning and you know working with lower social economic communities, for example. It's really rewarding um, if you put the effort in. The rewards are quite quick, and I think you know for me that's quite fun. And yeah, I think it's just diverse. It's just there's everything in it really, and no day is the same, and no issues are generally ever the same either. They're always slightly different, and they just get your brain going. Yeah, that's very true. It's always about tailing a solution to whatever that that problem or issue is at hand. I love the way that you're also very passionate about bridging the gap between academia and the profession of planning. I remember when I started work as a graduate planner, I was working at Sydney City Council, and I couldn't help think that there was a, a massive disconnect between what I had been studying over five years as a planner and then what I was being asked to do daily as a planner. You know, I remember the first time I was told to go out and sit in a site office in a suburb called Erskineville in in a city, um, Sydney, and deal with residents. I thought, wow, I didn't didn't have a subject called this. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, What are you doing, I guess, in that area to bridge that gap and to raise understanding about what planners do in real life? Yeah, really interesting question, Belinda, because I certainly felt exactly the same in my first couple of months um, of my first planning job. I guess I took matters into my own hands as soon as I finished uni. I had a really good relationship with the unit coordinator um, for STAT planning at the time, who's now actually, the, she's the whole Masters of Planning coordinator. But as soon as I finished studying, I basically reached out to the uni and said exactly, you know, how I felt, which is there's a massive disconnect. I feel like, you know, the university classroom was one thing, one type of planning. And then being in the real world, I was hit by a bus. And I wanted to help future students, both from a from a helping the profession perspective, but these are also future people that I might get to work with. So I was fortunate um, in that I was learning both at uni and at work because I started working basically towards the tail end of my first year of my degree. And not everyone had that opportunity. So I wanted to make sure that their uni days and what they're learning was more um, rich. So I reached out and actually ended up spending the first few years of my planning career with the University of Tasmania as a guest lecturer and helping them to update, for the lack of a better word, the statutory planning unit. And I also served on the course advisory committee for a little while, really using that platform to talk about how I feel like they need to bridge the gap. So I completely redesigned the stat planning course over three years. Obviously, we're kind of doing it bit by bit. We broke it up into topics throughout the 13 um, week semester, and those topics are really more focused around what kind of problems you would actually need to solve in real life. I also added in a lot of real life examples um, through projects that I've worked on or or slightly tweaked so that they were suitable for a classroom, projects that I had a good knowledge of that I could talk about and I guess dissect. I also wanted to make sure that the unit was relevant for planners who um, might want to go into consulting, who might want to stay in local government, state government, who might want to work elsewhere. So we also started adding in knowledge of different jurisdictions so that people didn't feel like they were stuck to Tasmania after completing the degree. And we definitely noticed an increase in interstate enrolments after that. And that has actually helped workshops in class because it meant that there was different people bring really different perspectives. And that really made the learning environment a lot more interesting. So I guess, yeah, I definitely took matters in my own hands um, to try and bridge the gap. I still continue to work with the university to a much lesser extent now just due to time constraints. But I guess outside of the university classroom, I'm also still actively involved with the students and the graduates through my work 
whether that's taking on student planners who might want a day or two of work a week or graduates who want a diverse range of planning before deciding what their forte might be. Because I really think that planning, as much as you can learn um, a lot in the classroom with a good, with a well-designed course, the bulk of the learning is actually in real life, you know, industry situations when you're dealt with, you know, time constraints and clients and you know, regulators. So there's a lot to it, but I think improving the university experience is definitely the first step to it. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And you're right. I mean, I think over my career, I've worked in local government, state government, haven't worked in federal government, a large part of it, private consulting. And yeah, it, it is great to be able to, I guess, share that experience, whether it's in a, you know, in a classroom environment with students like myself, I've also enjoyed doing some guest lecturing and because I do a lot of work in community consultation, you know, I have some horror stories and you just see, <laughs> you, share, you share them with students and they're, they're sort of aghast, like, what did you do? <laughs> so it can be quite funny. Yeah, I certainly think also it makes you a better communicator and planning is huge on communication, both written and verbal. Oh, it's all about communication. Yeah, and Lecturing has certainly helped me to talk to different people because, you know, what we think is simple everyday knowledge may not be, for example, for an international student. So how do you get them on board and, and up to scratch is is a skill of its own and actually makes you a better communicator more broadly. And that can be helping you to talk to your colleagues or your clients. Yeah, one of the biggest shocks I had, I think, when I was studying and then sort of progressing to to working in government was that we had never even did a subject you know and I'm going way back on, on how to read you know development application plans you know that was fundamental one two three of, of planning yet we hadn't done that at all at university so coming in and you know even though they were quite basic level DAs it was still a huge learning curve to actually start that process of understanding development assessment yeah most definitely. You would be aware of this. We have a shortage of planners across Australia. What would you say to 2024 school leavers who are looking at their career options? Should they take up urban planning? I would say for sure. Um, and I think one of the things is it's a diverse, kind of like engineering in a way that you can pick your fancy. Like if you like big things, infrastructure planning. If you like visioning, strategic planning. If you love reading, you know, black and white or I suppose grey parts of a scheme, then maybe you're a stat planner. And I think there's so many opportunities in the planning industry now for people to really just find your feet and develop a skill that you're passionate about. I guess certainly for me, I never thought I'd be a planner. I came out of uni thinking I'd be a medical researcher. And it was only until my honours year that I decided to actually revisit what I was passionate about. And that's kind of when I started to think about planning. Planning is all around you at the end of the day. The houses we live in, the paths we take our dogs to, the roads we drive on. So if you've got a passion for where you live or, or the things you interact with, then it could actually be your calling. Planning is so broad. So by all means, choose it and see where it takes you. Yeah, planning's been a fantastic career for me. So yeah, I'm very much behind encouraging people to take it up. Let's talk about planning for the future. It certainly fits with the uh, the Congress theme, planning in a time of change. In the opinion piece that you wrote for the Mercury, you wrote, planning is not easy. It is decision-making for the future. Planning is about thinking through the implications of a series of decisions before the first official decision is made. In our ever-changing society, planning is often subject to more pessimistic than optimistic visions of the future. As one of Australia's leading young planners, what are the big issues that planners need to manage to ensure an optimistic future? I think through uh, the work that I'm doing, one of the key issues um, is land use conflict. I think there are um, a lot of good intentions out there for you know more development, and that could be recreational housing infrastructure. But it's important not to lose sight of the values that are inherent and that are, I suppose, invisible with the landscapes, and that's the place and the people that we work with. I think it's it's really easy for us to sit down um, at our desk and say, you know, we plan this because it's good for the community. This is how much money we inject in the local community. This is how much jobs it will create through construction and operation. But we forget about the conflict that it could actually bring to the community that may have been here for you know many, many generations. And that's not to say that we then don't put anything new in there. It's actually about bringing the community along. And on some of the, you know, my favorite projects, that has been the best part about it is actually bringing the community along and being a true listener to their opinions and their histories and their views. And that forms a really key part of 
you know, the work we do. So land use conflict, I think, is one of the biggest issues. It covers not just housing supply. It's not just about, you know, traffic congestion, for example. It actually covers everything. I think the other key issue is that sometimes we tend to not be present. Planning is constantly involving in response to rapid and far-reaching changes um, in our wider society. And sometimes we, we're either too far ahead or we're um, a little bit behind. So I think it's actually finding the happy medium of being present, going at a pace that will promote development, but wouldn't then discourage communities from tagging along with that. So I think um, it's not really an issue. It's For me, it's a vision of being a planner. But yeah, I definitely think in terms of you know, issues that we need to manage for an optimistic future. That's definitely a key part of it. And this is a bit of a selfish question in some ways, because we we do a lot of work in community engagement. And I would love to hear your ideas for how we can get better at involving young people in strategic planning, because we clearly have to attract what I call that future voice when we're preparing strategic plans. Yeah, um, really interesting question. Definitely not selfish at all because um, it's actually a really fascinating part about involving young people in strategic planning. I think um, we often sit down and go, oh, well, only adults would provide you with reasonable and valuable inputs, but actually kids have an incredible vision ahead of them. And in their brains, they have um, imagination that actually can be quite tangible at times. I'm currently working on a project that actually involves young people in the engagement space. It's actually working with the local school and giving them a visioning exercise. And it's as simple as providing them a map and asking them to draw out their favourite place and then put one wish list item. And as planners, that's valuable inputs because then we understand what places can be a hub for, you know, activities for both big children and younger children to hang out and what places the community doesn't have that, you know, might be needed. So I think it's actually really important to get young people involved in shaping the community. They have a lot to say and it's at the end of the day, it's planning for them. They're the next generation that will use the space that you're working with. And we just need to be as planners a little bit more creative so that we're not talking planning schemes to them. We're not talking planning restrictions. We're talking about imagination and visioning with them. And there's, yeah, they've got um, some really interesting insights that they'll provide. Um, and I've thoroughly enjoyed this. This is the first time I've done it, but I yeah, can see how it's worked for other projects that I, I know. Yeah, well, particularly when we're, we're dealing with strategic planning and you know plans that often have a, a 20 to 40 year horizon, the plans we are creating are really for the futures that they're going to be enjoying. And so it is so vital that we do take the time to look for innovative ways to encourage them and bring them along in that plan making process. And I think it's really important to actually um, provide, you know, evidence of that engagement. So whether that be scans of their drawings into the actual plans, because I think then at the end of the day, they can think back 10, 15 years later and go, this is what we missed. But now my kids might have. And, you know, that is the inherent part of planning for a better place. You're absolutely right. I've really enjoyed talking with you today. Your passion, your energy, your enthusiasm you know, is contagious and you truly are an inspiring young planner and your career path, you know, is just fantastic and is, you know, you're going ahead in great leaps and bounds and it's going to be really exciting to watch you over the the coming years. Thank you also for all the excellent volunteer work you do Um, and I hope that people listening today really get inspired by that and and get on board and and give their time to organisations such as PIA. If you haven't already registered, I encourage you to go to the Congress events page of the PEER website and take advantage of the early bird rates. If you have any questions, please email congress at planning.org.au. My name is Belinda Barnett, and thank you for listening to the 2024 Planning Congress podcast.